On July 1st of 2016, I signed a contract that finalized the sale of my company, an email marketing platform called Drip. The following day, my life changed forever when the acquirer wired millions of dollars to my bank account. It was more money than I had ever seen in an amount that meant I would never have to work again. You probably think that all your worries go away when you sell a company for that much money. But honestly, the buildup of years of stress Damage I'd done to my mental health and frankly to my closest relationships made it a bittersweet moment. I also had to let go of the company that my co-founder and I had been building for the previous three and a half years. And during that time, Drip had become a big part of my identity. And on that day in July, I handed the keys to someone else. In this video, I'm going to talk about how I built a multi-million dollar startup with no venture capital. I'm gonna talk through my journey from being a software developer making several hundred thousand dollars a year for my own software products to building a rocket ship that changed the course of my life and culminated in a financial outcome I never would have expected. And per usual, if you stick around to the end, I'm gonna tell you the biggest regret I have around building, growing, and selling Drip. I'm Rob Walling. I've started six companies, five of them bootstrapped. I've written four books on entrepreneurship and I've invested in more than 125 startups. So we sold Drip in 2016, but now I wanna roll the calendar back four years earlier to 2012. I had this amazing lifestyle business called Hittail. It was a SaaS application that was doing tens of thousands of dollars a month in net profit, and I was the only employee. So it was a pretty amazing cash flow business. Hittail got a lot of traffic, mostly from SEO, and while it had a decent trial to paid conversion rate, I wanted to capture emails on the website since I had used email marketing in every product business that I had run to date and it had always been one of the most profitable channels. So I hired a contractor to help me out. He was working about 20 hours a week for me and I asked him to put an email capture widget on every page of the site. This is hundreds and hundreds of pages. And this is before this existed as a product. Now there's Optin Monster, there's Sumo. There's a bunch of options for email capture widgets. They didn't exist then. So the contractor I hired was actually Derek Reimer, whose name you might recognize if you followed me for any amount of time. He would later write every line of code for the first 15 months of Drip, and he became a retroactive co-founder as we started to scale the company. So it took him a week to wire up what I thought was a pretty simple request. He had to dig into open source JavaScript, write a bunch of custom JavaScript himself, style the thing, post subscribers into MailChimp, and I thought there has to be a better way than this. And we looked and there was not. So I realized that this might be a problem other entrepreneurs were having, which is I have hundreds and hundreds of pages on my website. I'm not gonna go and drop an embedded form into each page, but I want a little toaster pop-up widget, maybe a, an exit intent. We didn't offer exit intent at the time, but the idea was to get something where it's like JavaScript into a footer and now I can activate it and deactivate it across any or all pages on my website. That didn't exist as a product when we started building Drip, and that was the initial idea for it. So instead of going in my basement and coding for six months, I went to try to validate this. I emailed 17 entrepreneurs that I knew. I asked if they would pay for a nice widget plus an email sequence. 11 of them said yes, and that was enough validation for me. I decided to productize the widget, and at that point, I called it Velvet Mail, and I'm glad, whoo, dodged a bullet with that one. I'm glad uh, it later was renamed Drip before we launched. But my contractor, Derek, agreed to work the other half of his week. Because remember, he was working 20 hours a week on Hittail. This might show you that I had no idea what Drip would become. I was not building it to be some multi-million dollar company. I literally thought it would be another nice lifestyle business. I wanted it to get bigger than Hittail, but I had no idea how big it could get. So Derek agreed to work the other half of his week building it and we sketched out the basic functionality and he started coding. All that was in there was an email capture widget you could install with one line of JavaScript. Then you had an email follow-up sequence once someone subscribed and that's it. There were no broadcast emails. I don't believe you could even be in multiple sequences at the same time or switch sequences. It was, it was very, very simple. And so while Derek built, I got excited because when you're building, you know all the potential that you have when you're gonna launch, right? It's this really exciting time. And so he was writing code and I was marketing. And I went out and marketed in every way I knew how. I was starting to do SEO with blog posts and essays. I went on every podcast that I could get on. I used my social media following. I ran Facebook ads. This was all going to a landing page. Back then it was at getdrip.com. And the value proposition was, we're gonna improve your visitor to trial conversion rate using email marketing. That was it. I didn't go into a bunch of specifics about exactly how it would work, but I was able to gather 3,400 emails for our launch list. 
And 3,400 emails, I thought was pretty good. It was probably the biggest launch list I'd ever had. So six months after the first line of code, in the middle of 2013, we onboarded our first two or three customers. We did this completely manually, by hand, so to speak. There was no billing in place. There was no way to create an account. Everything was manually inserted into a database just to get a couple people in. These were people that I knew. We instantly ran into several speed bumps too. We thought we'd covered everything, but of course we had not. So an example of that is if someone unsubscribed from Drip, they would still be subscribed on your main email list. Because remember, Drip was almost like an add-on to MailChimp or Aweber or your other email service provider. It couldn't do all the functionality that a MailChimp or an Aweber could do. It was, it was really an add-on. And so you had to use both. And that instantly became a pain point because if someone unsubscribed from your MailChimp list, now are they still receiving it from Drip and vice versa? We started to realize that Drip was severely limited in its feature set, and really it probably should have been a feature of a larger email marketing platform. So we started building a few features to make it into an email marketing platform or email service provider to compete with the likes of MailChimp or Aweber, although we were a light version of that. We didn't have all the functionality. That was not the original vision for Drip, but we realized within the first five, 10 customers that we had to change something because there wasn't enough value for people. And this is something as an entrepreneur yourself, you're gonna run into where you have a vision and you're so sure that it's gonna be a half a million dollar product or a $10 million product. And once a customer starts using it, you're gonna realize, wow, I was wrong. And you have to be able to take in disparate and often confusing and contradictory feedback and make these hard decisions with incomplete information. This was one decision that I made, which was to turn Drip into essentially an email service provider. So we added broadcast emails, we added some reporting, took a month or two, and pretty soon we were a lightweight email marketing platform with a great user interface. We had about 10 customers, each paying us around $50 a month. Then over the course of the next several months, we used a phased launch, which I've talked about on this channel before. We launched to all 3,400 people on our launch list. So it was three to 500 people every few weeks. We would launch, people would come in, we'd get them onboarded, we'd build frantically the things they needed to not cancel, and then we'd do it all over again. And so over the course of, I think it was about four or five months, we landed almost 200 paying customers and our revenue was just under $8,000 of MRR by the end of 2013. I was stoked. $8,000 at the time was enough to pay for, you know, mostly full-time employee. I thought it was a great launch and I was ready for rocket ship status and to start adding two, three, four thousand dollars $4,000 of MRR to drip each month, but that didn't happen. What actually happened is we hit a massive plateau as Paul Graham says, we hadn't built something people wanted. In today's terms, you might say we had little or no product market fit. I like to think we had weak product market fit. What had happened is I had the curse of the audience. I had a bunch of people in my audience who wanted to support me, wanted to help me out, wanted to check out what I was up to, but they didn't really need a new email service provider. And so people would sign up and then they would leave. We weren't different enough from cheaper players. MailChimp and Aweber were cheaper than us at low levels of subscribers. So I agonized over this. It killed me that I was pumping money into ads. I was doing all this marketing and we were leaking our customers out the bottom of a leaky bucket. Churn was too high. We did not have product market fit. So I spent the next couple months watching cancellation feedback and having a bunch of one-on-one -on -one conversations with customers, a lot via email. And there was a lot of noise, like a lot of disparate feedback. You should lower your prices. This isn't worth $49 a month. Build a mobile app, add a CRM, and then this would be worth it, right? The months were very stressful and I was filled with a ton of self-doubt. And it was at this time that I started really confiding in my developer, Derek Reimer, about the direction of the product. And we started really discussing, you know, which way should this go? And I'm gonna be honest, during this time, I had imposter syndrome like crazy. I don't know if you've heard of that, but the idea is that you think you're an imposter and that you're not actually good at something that you are good at. So I had already built three successful companies before this. I was supposed to be good at this. I knew how to market, I knew how to code, I knew how to grow software products, but the nagging doubt kept creeping in. That doubt of, did I really just get lucky with everything before this? As I was wrestling with this self-doubt over the course of several months, losing sleep, anxious, stressed, there was one piece of feedback I got from a couple people. It wasn't a ton, but it was three, four people. And it really resonated with me. The feedback was build email automations, turn Drip into a marketing automation platform. And I'm gonna be honest, I didn't know what that was. This was probably January or February of 2014. I had used several different email service providers, MailChimp, Aweber, Campaign Monitor, but I had never heard of marketing automation and I didn't know what email automations were. 
So I buckled in and I did a bunch of research. So I found out there are things like if you buy a product, let's say through Stripe or Shopify or PayPal, that your marketing automation platform gets pinged and you tag that subscriber with a customer tag. Or if they click a link in an email, you can receive a tag that you're interested in a particular type of content. Today, this is table stakes, right? For any email service provider, and you, they wouldn't even call themselves a marketing automation provider. But back then it was kind of like email marketing, but with more intelligence and more sophistication and a little more automation baked in. And I resisted this. It sounded terrible, it sounded complicated. It sounded boring. All the marketing automation providers were these big enterprise companies. They were crappy software. And I felt like I was gonna be entering a space that I wouldn't enjoy and it was gonna be stressful. And they had all raised tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. And then at one point, I realized we could seriously disrupt these players. People really disliked the big tools. These were called Entreport, Infusionsoft, Marketo, Pardot, Silverpop. They were overpriced, so we could be cheaper and still make a ton of money. Our UX and user interface was far superior already, and I knew we could maintain that. We used a self-service model with an optional demo. They required a whole sales process. We moved faster. We didn't have their funding or their brand recognition, but I felt like our advantages as a nimble startup could win out against these massive incumbents, many of whom, as I said, had raised tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. And in fact, that's how it played out. We obviously didn't topple these big incumbents, but we carved out an incredibly profitable niche. And from that point until we built a multi-million dollar SaaS company was less than two years. It was a pretty incredible journey. So rolling back to that moment where I just decided we have to take this risk. I talked to Derek, I said, I think we need to dive into marketing automation. And over the next seven months, we built and launched one automation at a time. We put them into production. And with each automation launched, our trial to paid conversion went up and our churn went down. Every metric of the business changed for the better. I remember looking in our custom dashboard that had all our, our SaaS metrics and pointing to the graphs and saying to Derek, that's it, that's what product market fit looks like all the numbers just switched from being a flatlined business to something that started growing by two or $3,000 in MRR that month and every month thereafter. And I wanna be clear, it wasn't just product. It wasn't just adding features. I was marketing like crazy. I hired a head of marketing and we were running Facebook and YouTube ads. I appeared on every podcast that would have me sound familiar, hammering out articles for SEO. We built and co-promoted dozens of integrations, which brought us a lot of new customers. It was pedal to the metal on both product and the marketing fronts. And pretty soon our growth accelerated. It wasn't just two or $3,000 a month of MRR. By the time we hit 40 or 50,000 a month, we were growing at 5K a month. And then later on, we were growing at 10,000 dollars of MRR every month. And I'll be honest, it was hard work and it was stressful. And I thought about the business day and night. We expanded the team. We eventually had 10 people on the team completely bootstrapped. And we were actually Venture Beats number one choice for marketing automation providers for SMBs. And we made their top 12 list of marketing automation providers out of hundreds of competitors. And the other nine ahead of us had all raised millions, if not decamillions in funding. I hadn't built Drip to sell it, but we started getting a lot of inbound interest, both of venture capitalists who wanted to invest, but also people who wanted to acquire Drip. And as it was growing, I became stressed that I had literally millions upon millions of dollars in net worth stuck in this one software product. And by that time I had sold all my other products, companies, whatever you wanna call them. So I was all in on Drip and it made me nervous. Over the course of about 18 months, we had five or six pretty serious conversations about selling Drip. And the acquisition that wound up going through took 13 months from the first email that I received from Click Collins in June of 2015. During that time, we negotiated and walked away many times. It was the most stressful year of my life by far. We were growing the company, not knowing if we were gonna keep it or sell it, and all the while negotiating like crazy for the best deal. It took a toll on me mentally, which impacted how I related to my friends and family. And I really had no space for anyone else but kind of my own agonizing thoughts. And that's one thing that I never wanna do again. When the deal closed in July of 2016, I called a friend of mine and I told him I'd sold the company. And I just cried, I cried on the phone and it wasn't sadness and it wasn't happiness. It was too many emotions to contain. And honestly, it took me months, maybe even more than a year to decompress and to get back to a normal sense of self and sense of life after the Drip sale closed. I worked on Drip for another 18 months after that. And when Derek and I left in 2018, I took six months off as he started working on his next startup. I played my guitar, I hung out with my family, and I read a lot of books. It was one of the most peaceful times in my life. And I celebrated 
the journey you know, of building and selling Drip. But one thing that never returned, it has never returned since that moment in 2016, is the self-doubt and the imposter syndrome that I felt in the early days of Drip. By building and selling Drip, I had proven to myself permanently, at least until now, seven years later, that I could do it. And I could do it again. And that confidence has carried on as I've grown my company's MicroConf and TinySeed. In the stair-step method, Drip was my step four business. The stair-step method only has three steps, but I'd already had a profitable standalone SaaS with Hittail, but Drip was that next level, the 10X business. It was 10X larger, 10X more competitive, and 10X harder. And in all honesty, I've never regretted the decisions I made while running Drip, nor the decision to sell it. But I do have one regret that I'm gonna tell you about in a minute. Before I do that, I wanna let you know about my new book, it contains everything that I learned building and growing Drip and everything before and since as I've invested in 125 companies. You can see the cool cover here to my right and I have a preview copy here of the hardcover. I'm running a Kickstarter in April and I'd love it, but if you would check it out and back it, you can go to sasplaybook.com to find out more about this book that can help you do what I did, build an incredible company without venture capital. As we wrap, I wanna tell you about my biggest regret. And it's that I didn't do a better job of managing my emotional and my mental health. I was a wreck for months, maybe more, maybe more than a year. I was sometimes stressed, I was sometimes depressed, and it really took a toll on my relationships, as I said above. If I could change one thing about my experience, I would have spent more time exercising, I would have spent more time sleeping, I would have spent much more effort and resources staying sane so that I could live a happy life while building and exiting such an incredible company. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like and subscribe. In next week's video, I'm gonna cover two new AI tools you've probably never heard of.